Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are in for a treat this afternoon. Um, this is our final practical skills session together. And um, we have a very special guest here with us today. It is Derek Lance. He is from the um, Eastern Territory. He's the Territorial Music Secretary there. And he uh, conducts the New York Staff Band. And um, yeah, he's going to talk to us today about rehearsal strategies. And um, I'm just gonna um, hand it over to you and let you take it away. Um, but Derek, thanks again. Thanks for coming today and um, being our guest. And we're really looking forward to uh, the information you have for us today. Awesome. Well, thanks, Tom. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Um, well, I guess it's, it's good for you to all be together and for me to be in my office uh, all by myself at the moment. But, uh, but talking to each of you, um, it's been cool to see uh, some photos and that kind of thing of uh, of your event throughout the week, uh, just to you know kind of at least get a little glimpse of what's happening. Um, so it's great to see all these leaders uh, gathered together um, and learning and uh, developing their craft a little bit more. So um, today, uh, I guess I was given the topic of rehearsal strategy. Uh, that was uh, what was given to me. And I'll say, um, I'll probably start uh, maybe before that and just kind of some, uh, like, I guess my mindset just for general, you know, leadership uh, rules, they'll go really quickly and then walk into some um, preparation, you know, things for rehearsals and then also uh, some tips for in rehearsal. So um, I'll try to cover all those things as we're going through. Um, and I'll just say, uh, I guess, Tom, uh, if anyone at any point has a question or, uh, you like something unpacked uh, a little bit more than what I what I said uh, right now? Feel free to stop me, and we can go uh, longer on a particular uh, topic or or moment. So uh, feel free to hop in uh, at any point. Um, so I won't really know unless someone uh, yells at me because I'm staring at uh, some lights and a tree at the moment. So just uh, yell if if you want anything. So um, just to to get started, um, I. I would say I have some just kind of basic, uh, simple rules for myself um, as a leader. And I, I guess I should say everything that I'm talking about today are just really things that are that are mine uh, in terms of like my mindset and then also, you know, my way of working you know, with people uh, with the groups that I have. Right. So it may not be 100 percent relevant to your situation, uh, but hopefully you can grab uh, something for uh, for your group and and where you are. Uh, right now. So uh, just as a starting point, my basic rules uh, for uh, being a leader, um, it comes down to really uh, four things for me. Um, as a leader, you want to be the most prepared person in the room all the time, right? Um, you want to be the most committed person uh, in the room all the time. You never want to ask anything, anyone to do anything that you wouldn't do uh, yourself. Uh, and then you want to respect people's time. Um, so you want to come prepared, um, you want to be committed, you want to respect people's time. So be the most prepared, be the most committed, don't ask anyone in your group to do anything you wouldn't do yourself, uh, and then respect people's times uh, by doing all the above, right? So those are my four kind of basic uh, rules. So just talking about being the most uh, prepared, uh, just some other little uh, kind of tidbits underneath that I have, um, have a plan uh, for what you will do. Right. So that's the first thing. Um, have a great understanding of the music, um, have a plan of attack for making it all better, know all the parts and more importantly, uh, know your people and know how to get uh, the best out of your people. Right. So that's all in the uh, being the most prepared uh, section there. So have a plan for what you will do. Have a great understanding of the music, have a plan of attack for making it all better, know all the parts and then most importantly, uh, know your people. Uh, falling into the category of uh, being the most uh, committed, um, I'd say above above all, be consistent, right? And there's uh, nothing more frustrating to a group of people than to have a leader that doesn't show up or who isn't consistent or who doesn't prepare uh, for, for what they're going to do, right? So second part of that is always show up, right? Always show up for, for everything uh, that you have on your calendar. And for me, um, you know, if there's something happening at the core, uh, be there, right? Even if it's not something that's uh, related to the band um, or something you're directly tied to, you know, be, be there, show up, um, because uh, it's important to do that uh, as a leader. Uh, so another part of being the most uh, committed, right? 
no no real excuses from from you about why you're not prepared or why you're late for something. Just don't have any excuses. Uh, just be there on time. Uh, show up uh, ready to roll. Um, the next part of, of being the most committed would be to set the standard, right? So however you want the people in your group um, to act um, or how to be prepared, you need to set that standard uh, all the time and be out in front uh, of all those things, right? And the last part of, of being you know, the most committed, it really comes back to that don't ask anyone to do anything you wouldn't do, right? So the great example for me all the time is if your core or core band, you know, does a lot of uh, kettle groups or caroling at Christmas time, um, do the most hours of anyone, right? If there's a requirement for people in your core band to do four hours of kettles, make sure you do more than that, right? So you can set the standard. You can be uh, the example uh, all the time, right? So those are just a few kind of basic ground rules for myself uh, in terms of leadership. Hopefully I, I live by them uh, most of the time, but just some important things there, right? It comes back to being the most prepared, be the most committed. Don't ask anyone in your group to do anything you wouldn't do. And then respect everyone's time by doing all those things uh, listed above there, right? So that's just some baseline things uh, for me. Um, now, just hopping into, um, you know, what music to choose, uh, what you want to do uh, with your groups. And I'll just go through this really quickly, and then we'll get into uh, the preparation uh, time of things. And I put it into three categories uh, for what music to choose, and they are practical, um, music with a purpose, and music for the players, right? So the three Ps, um, I did that on purpose, right? So practical, you want to choose music that is at an appropriate level for your group. Uh, you want to choose music that can be easily attained, music that will require a bit of work, and then some that have some uh, longevity to it that you'll need to work out uh, for a while, right? So have different tiers of things you're going to do. And then the last part of the practical thing would be, will it connect with your congregation or audience, right? So practical, choose things that are appropriate for you, um, have a variety of things, either easily attainable, kind of middle of the road, and then long-term projects so you can have uh, things happening. Um, at all different levels there. And then the last question is, you know, will it connect uh, with your congregation? So going to the, the second one, which would be um, purpose of the, the second uh, kind of P there would be, does your music fit the theme of a meeting you know, that is coming up? So that's the first part of that. Do you have a special program coming up that the music can be used, used for? And then the last three of the, of the purpose there would be creating a moment. Right. So you want to choose something because, hey, I'm, I'm going to I'm trying to create this scenario or I'm trying to lead people to this. I'm going to choose this music just for that specific purpose. Right. So it's, you know, does your music fit the theme of a meeting? Do you have a special program coming up? And then also, do you want to create a moment? And that's kind of those uh, three areas of uh, of purpose uh, there. And the last one uh, would be music you know, for the players. Um, choose music that your players will enjoy. Because uh, if they enjoy it, they're going to practice it more. If they practice it more, they're going to sound better. Um, choose music that will stretch your players. Um, and then choose music that will also make your players practice, right? If everyone shows up every week and they can immediately uh, play the music that's been put in front of them, they're not going to have to work uh, super hard at it. And they probably won't, uh, won't practice at it. So uh, things for the players, you know, choose music that your players will enjoy. Uh, choose music that will stretch them and choose music that will make them practice. Um, so those are the three kind of um, subcategories of the players there. So choosing music, practical, purpose, and then something for, uh, for your players, All right? So that's kind of just the you know, bit of introduction there. And now uh, we can get into some uh, preparation thing. Once again, if you have any questions for about anything in the world, um, just feel free to stop. Uh, so I'm not just uh, talking the whole time here. Yep. Derek, um, something that's come up several times, um, and today we've asked our, our previous guest, you know, in a core band situation, you might have some really, really great players in certain sections, and then you've got, you know, um, at the other end of the section, you might have, you know, someone who's struggling um, just as a player. So what is your um, philosophy maybe on music selection? Obviously, you know, you want to challenge your good players, but you don't want to leave the other players in the dust. So I, 
I was just curious about that. Yeah, I, well, I think uh, the the first thing, uh, and this has nothing to do with choosing music, but um, you know, it's really just it's engaging the best of your players so that uh, they know what kind of the plan is, right? So if you have to play music that maybe is at a, a lower level than they want to all the time, if they can be involved in the process of choosing some of those things, that helps them uh, along, right? Um, so I would say, let's say if you had like an A plus, you had you know three or four A plus players and then a group of, of C players, Right, you don't always want to live in A, and you don't always want to live in C. You kind of want to you want to live in like that B area, so that it's close enough uh, for the the really good players to have to at least pay attention and to be engaged, and it's just uh, maybe a slight bit higher uh, for the ones that might struggle a little bit, you know. But I think that just comes back to ult ultimately uh, just having those those three categories of things that everyone will be able to play pretty easy, uh, things that will then stretch some people. Um, and then things that will stretch everyone, you know, collectively. So I think if you just have a variety in that and then also involve like your, your key players there, um, they'll be really on board uh, with what you're doing. Um, so like, hey, I really have to choose a lot of, you know, American band journal music because we only have this many people. It's not really the dream repertoire for anyone, but hey, what are your favorites? You know, what are your favorite pieces, you know, within the American band journal so that they have some some buy-in and ownership uh, to the music that you're going to play. Does that make sense? Yes, that was great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, all right. So uh, hopping into any other questions. Sorry, Tom, you're still there. So I wasn't sure if so you have I'm anything I'm just going to stand here now so you're not talking to a tree. Okay, great. Just wave if, uh, you know, if I need to, to stop. Sure. So, all right, very good. So um, getting into the preparation side of, of things, I mean, I, I must say and be honest with everyone here is like, this is the part that I love, right? I love the process of, of learning a new piece of music, um, kind of wrapping my head all around everything that's there and then coming up with a plan and strategy, you know, for making things better, right? It's, it's my favorite thing to do. Uh, with a group kind of going up to that first rehearsal of a big piece or or whatever it might be like i really really love uh this part of it um and like i think i do a good job of organizing myself uh for it so hopefully that can uh be shown uh, here in a moment so um just uh how to prepare and there's a whole bunch of kind of uh, subcategories um but i have three big headings uh, for how to prepare listen study and then conduct right those are the three under kind of the preparation thing that i'll talk about right now so that's listen study and conduct so in listen and once again this is my like process for things it may not work for everyone it may be something uh, different than other people will do but this is just how uh, i've done it uh, as a player and then also as as a conductor so listen and this is this is kind of my process for things right listen to the music without um like the score in front of you, right? If you're, if you're, let's say we're gonna, we're gonna work on the present age, right? Just as an example, I wanna listen to the music without uh, the sheet music in front of me, just to get an overall feel for it without being uh, kind of consumed with the paper that's in front of me or, or the marking, just to kind of get a, a broader sense of, of what the piece is, right? So that's the first kind of element of listening, do it without the music in front. Second part of it would be find varying recordings of a piece, right? So don't just find one and then try to copy exactly what that is. Um, you know, try to find a variety of things so you can uh, learn how different people do things and come up with different uh, ideas, right? So that would be the kind of the second step uh, in the listening process. The third one would be um, listen with the sheet music in front of you and start making small notes about things that you notice, right? Things that you know people may have done in a performance that you really enjoyed or things that you may not necessarily uh, agree with, or just things that you know, like, hey, I'm gonna have to go back here uh, and do, do some work to figure this out, right? And then the last part of the listening would be identifying you know, potential pitfalls, right? So that's kind of doing that with the music in front of you. So for me, I wanna listen to the music without anything there, just to enjoy the moment of the music and to, to experience that as a, as a listener, right? And then I wanna find a variety of recordings just to get as much um, you know, variety in terms of um, styles, tempos, um, different shape of different things, 
And that's, that's kind of what I would want to do. Then I would want to listen to the music uh, with actually the score in front of me and start to make little, little notes about things that you notice um, and then just start to identify some small uh, pitfalls uh, within the music. So that's a little bit of just kind of the listening aspect of things. There's, there's more there, but that's, um, I've got four bullet points. So that's, that's, that's what we're going with on that, right? So there's, there's four things there. The next part of it um, would be um, the actual studying uh, portion of the thing, right? So uh, once again, I just have a few things that are underneath that. So in the study portion, um, listen with the music in front of you, right? So that's part of the whole process. The last one as well, right? Start to identify pitfalls, start to identify places that you'd want to, um, you know, that you'd want to change or that kind of stuff. The second part of studying uh, for me is that at some point um, you have to stop listening to your dream recording of it, right? At some point you have to put that away and start making it your own thing, right? So if we're, we're going back to uh, the present age, just because I'll just keep using that one as an example, right? Um, like my favorite recording would be like the essays for brass, you know, album there um, with that kind of stuff. So it's like, okay, this is, this is my favorite one. I enjoy different parts about this, but you know, when you come to a concert or doing a recording of your own, like you don't just want to recreate the essays for brass thing, right? So you need to put away uh, the listening aspect of things for me and start to make it your own, right? Start to, you know, figure out the shapes and lines of things uh, with no longer having that audio uh, with you, right? So that's uh, the second part of uh, studying, you know, listen with the music in front of you and then at some point put that, the music away and start to really make it uh, your own and different things there. The third part of, of studying uh, would be marking up your score and highlighting um, all the you know, important key points, right? So time, you know, tempo, dynamics, um, important lines that are you know, together and that kind of stuff. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the third part of that studying portion is marking up your score basically so that, um, I don't want to say it becomes dummy proof, but um, you, all, of, all of your questions and answers that you have are there for you so that you can uh, communicate the best uh, that you can all the time. We do and have then one, one quick yeah. question. Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Come use the microphone. So the question is um, do you have a source that you go to? You know, a lot of people back in our, our day, we'd go to trade and just get as many CDs as we could. Well, do you have a source now that you go to, you know, to find those essential recordings that you listen to? Yeah, like, uh, truth be told, like my go to for anything like in the world at this point is just to go to YouTube and start to type in like, you know, the present age, Leslie Condon, and just see how many show up. Because a lot of times you'll get like a studio recording version that just has like a photo there the whole time or something like that. Or you'll have uh, performances, you know, random performances, you know, at music camps or, you know, you find a great variety there. Um, so that's kind of my first go-to uh, just in terms of finding a variety of things. Um, an easy place to go now is the whole essay music index, you know, .com, you know, thing um, where they have recordings there. It's one recording, you know, for a piece of music, but I kind of just live like on the on the YouTube side of things at this point, uh, minus just like ones that I know that are my favorites. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if I'm looking for variety, that's where I'd go. The other thing on SA Music Index, and this has just been my kind of core bandmaster life hack, is if you look at SA Music Index and you see the title, if they have like the audio and a video and a, you know, if there's multiple sources, those are usually the more popular uh pieces of music that are used or purchased so you look if if something has a whole bunch of icons next to it that's usually a pretty popular you know piece of music that's used in a course so if you are looking for repertoire and you don't really you know you're not well versed in salvation army literature just yet um kind of that's kind of a sneaky way to kind of figure out what's used more than others so that doesn't mean that the other music is not good it just means that that's probably the most used um, repertoire. Cool. So um, just kind of hopping back into the, the studying portion, right? So we have, um, you want to listen, you know, with music in front of you, 
at some point you want to put that uh, the audio recording away and you want to start to make it uh, your own. You want to mark up the score, you know, highlighting anything that you uh, think is important or that may cause a problem. Um, and then the last you know, thing I would just say there is you want to provide enough information for yourself on the score so that you can't get it wrong, right? So you want to put enough stuff there uh, so that you really have no chance of getting it wrong in rehearsal or performance, right? So that's uh, kind of how far you want to go with that. So the third, uh, I think it's the third part of how to prepare is the actual conducting you know, piece. Um, and this, this starts with, um, let's just assume if you're at this point, you have kind of the baseline um, of you know, conducting skills and you know how to kind of to get through things, you know all the patterns, you know all that stuff, right? So we're going past that uh, in this, right? So for me, um, and I know, like I've been in some places uh, in, you know, in school or whatever, where they would say, absolutely under no circumstances should you conduct along with a recording because then you're just trying to recreate the recording. So I get that in terms of making it your own, but just in terms of being practical, and guaranteeing that you can get through something and be confident in front of a group of people, I would suggest conduct along with a recording to make sure that you can navigate everything. You can navigate all the time changes. You can, and it's not going to be perfect, right? But at least you start to get a baseline for uh, being able to get through the whole thing, right? So once you can do that, you get through the whole thing, um, you're confident about all the changes and different things that will happen. You want to put away the recording, right? You want to do this on your own. You want to pr practice conducting based on the notes that you have and not on the recording that's in front of you, right? So going back to when you were study studying and you were making notes, if you say, well, hey, here the tempo is marked at 126, this recording did it at 130, 136, but I want to do it some other place, you want to start to lock in your place uh, in that music, right? So put away the recording, practice conducting based on the notes that you have made. The third part of the conducting uh, part would be, you know, practice the transitions uh, with a metronome, right? So if you're going from uh, quarter note equals 76, uh, and then you have an Excel that takes you to quarter note equals 136, you need to lock in what 76 feels like, right? And then you need to know what 136 feels like so you can make that transition, right? Your body needs to memorize uh, the shifts in tempo or different things that you're going to do, right? So if you're practicing, right, I'm at 76, right? And I know eventually I have to get to 136, then you have to be able to lock into those two places and be very comfortable with, with the, uh, the bookends of those tempo changes, right? So practice transitions with a metronome so that your body can memorize uh, the shifts, right? The last part of the conducting practice, I would say, is practice cues and cueing people to make it easier on the players for the first rehearsal, right? So if, um, and the example is almost always the trombones, right? If they've been resting for like 24 measures, right? Make sure you mark something there. So it's like, hey, I'm gonna make sure and cue them because you know, with the first read, who knows like what, what's happening and all that. Be prepared with, uh, with big cues so that once again, they can do as, as good as possible on that very first reading, right? So. In the conducting portion again, right? It's conduct along with the recording, so you can navigate all the time changes. You want to eventually put away the recording and start to make uh, make it your own based on the markings that you've made. You want to practice transitions uh, with a metronome so that you can you can memorize uh, and your body can feel what those what those feel like. And then you want to practice uh, cueing players uh, in your band as well so that they can know okay, this is coming. You can set them up for success, right? So we get back to just the whole preparing thing. Three big things is listen, study, and conduct, right? And we could go back through all 12 of those, of those points, but I won't do that, right? So it's listen, study, and conduct, and the different elements that go into each one of those. Now, I said uh, earlier, um, I, I absolutely love like the preparation uh, for, uh, for getting ready for things. So um, yeah, so I kind of, I think I kind of go overboard with some things, but you know, there it is, right? So uh, we talked earlier about marking up the score and highlighting key things. I'm just going to walk you through what I do um, and how how I do that. Uh, once again, it might not be the same for for anyone on the planet, but I'll just kind of go through what my system is, and it's you know what I do for each piece uh, that we'll we'll do, right? So I. Um, end up using four colors, right, to mark up everything uh, in my score. 
right? And I should have brought a good example of that, but I, I don't have, well, I have them in a box sitting over there, but um, you know, four different colors, right? Which you can be any colors in the world. For me, it is black, blue, red, and green. And I'll walk through what, what each one does, right? So all the black markings that are in the score, these are all things related to time, right? So you're talking about time signatures, uh, time changes, tempo changes, tempo markings, any fermatas or breaks, you know, anything like that. Basically, it's anything having to do with time at all, I mark in black, right? And for me, um, if we're talking about something with a lot of time changes, right? Um, and it, it depends on what's happening at the moment, but the baseline for me is like, I put it up, up above the cornet line, I mark it where uh, in the first and second baritone, right in the middle of it, and then mark it as well in the percussion section. Right. And sometimes that'll change uh, based on um, like, let's say the baritones are are resting for this whole section. I probably wouldn't put the time changes there. I'll put them with whoever is the most involved. Right. So anything that's in black is anything related with time. Right. So time signatures, time changes, tempo changes, tempo markings, formatas or anything else you can think of relative to time. Um, blue, uh, which is the second one for me. Um, these are just kind of important parts or lines that I want to highlight, right? Um, so this is, uh, this is cues and that kind of stuff. So important parts that are in the piece I want to highlight in blue. Parts that have been resting for a while that may need assistance, you know, coming back in. That's another thing where I will kind of bracket in like, okay, the trombone's been off for 24 measures. Let me just make sure and mark that they are coming in so that I can be uh, prepared there. Um, anything that you think uh, needs a cue, I would mark that in blue. Um, and then the second part of that would be um, after you've rehearsed a piece and then something is problematic for someone, then you could change that also. And okay, well, really it's the horns here that might have an issue coming in. So I'm going to change that bracket to a blue thing for them. So I know that the horns uh, could use some help uh, at that moment. Um, and then the last part of, of kind of this, this section of kind of things that are involving cues, right? I mark in things that are cues for the players in the band, but then also um, it's cues for the audience to also know what is important maybe at that moment, right? So um, if we're, we're going along and all of a sudden the, you know, the back row has, has the big melody at something, if you yourself are you know, with the back row um, and you know, bringing them along, where do you think the audience is going to go, right? They're also going to go with the back row. So, right, if they have that big melody at the end of whatever it might be, they'll know, okay, that's the important thing. They'll be listening for that as well. They'll notice uh, the important part as well. So you cue the players, but then also cue the audience, right? And so that's something just to think about um, as well uh, in there. So that's kind of the, the blue is really for anything for cueing um, all over the place. Red, um, and this is really anything related to dynamics, right? So it's any dynamic markings that I think, um, you know, are worth highlighting, um, any crescendos, decrescendos, that kind of stuff, um, varying dynamics around the band. So if the cornets are at piano and the trombones are at forte, you know, you'd want to highlight those things so you don't get stuck into the, no, no, we're forte right now. We're really, uh, there's different tiers happening all over the place. And then the last thing kind of re related to dynamics would be, things that you need to change in the music um, to make it uh, sound the way you want and maybe sound the way it was meant to sound, right? So I think everyone probably has, uh, you know, a section in band maybe that just generally plays louder, you know, than what is marked there and some that will generally play softer. So sometimes you need to change uh, their dynamics to make it, uh, you know, achieve what the composer was hoping for, right? Um, so anything in red is really all about dynamics um, and that's kind of the, the simple version of that there. And then the last uh, section um, is green and it's kind of the catch all for anything else in the world I wanna mark in. Um, so that would be, you know, if there's accents uh, in music or note length things, you know, tenudos, staccatos, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and then one of the things that I like to do, which can be helpful uh, in rehearsal for me, let's say um, the solo horn and second trombone are the only two people that have a line together in music, right? I would kind of bracket those two parts in green and maybe draw an arrow to connect the two. So you know, like, oh, those people are together, right? So it does save you a little bit of time uh, in the rehearsal. So when you're going through, it's like, oh, okay, uh, solo horn, second trombone, you guys are together here. 
you know, and I've already connected those dots in my preparation, you know, for it. So once again, it kind of goes back to that, you know, provide enough information so that it can't go wrong uh, portion of things. So that's how I'd mark up all my, all my scores. I do four colors and it's basically one for time, um, one for cues, one for dynamics, and then the catch all, uh, which is kind of everything else, but that mostly relates to kind of note length and, you know, connection of, of lines. As a, as a conductor, um, how do you prioritize what color you're going to go with? So like, um, you know, you may have a couple bars, but you've got four colors, let's just say, yeah. you know, happening at the same time. Um, you know, just speak to us a little bit about that, your choice. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know if I've ever thought about that. Um, well, I think it just kind of goes, goes in, in order for me of, the, the first thing I always want to have happen is make sure that everything is in time uh, and in rhythm with each other. So that's like step number one, right? So that's kind of like your, your entrance into playing a piece of music is play all the right notes at the right time. So I think it depends on where you are in the sequence of activities and your preparation, right? So um, if um, you're on your first rehearsal of something the time signature and getting everyone to do that stuff is going to be the most important. Then I would probably say uh, for me, uh, like note lengths and playing like with the right kind of, you know, if it's a, you know, an accent that looks like this or, or like this, but you want to make sure those happen next, right? Because once, once note lengths kind of go wrong for me, um, you're never getting them back. Right. So if you're really, really wanting a really long quarter note, Right. So a quarter note starts on beat one, finishes at beat two. Right. That's you have to lock that in right away. Otherwise, that ship has sailed. Um, and then I would get into like the, the dynamic stuff uh, kind of later on, because I think that's you can you can evolve with that as it's going along. But uh, getting things perfectly in time uh, and then in sync in terms of note length and approach and style on particular notes, like I would put that up uh, right up after that. And then once those things are conquered, then you can start to do things uh, with line and dynamics. But that's just me. Like, I, I just, I think much more uh, kind of about the structure of it all first before, before line, right? But that's, that's just how my brain functions. Is that a good answer? Yes. Sweet. Thanks. Thank you for the very, very good encouragement there. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the big pieces of, of marking up a, up a score. Um, and then uh, you get into, you know, preparing yourself to rehearse a piece, right? Um, and I'll say this, right? You know, learning the music, you know, marking the score, knowing your band and being able to conduct all the music is really a requirement before you can start to rehearse the band, right? So let me say, say that one more time. So learning the music, marking your score, knowing your band and being able to conduct all the music, that's all required before you can step in front of a band, right? So if you can't do those things, um, then it's going to be hard, hard for you, right? So that's kind of the, the big, big portion there. So, so preparing yourself uh, to rehearse a piece is just some questions, right? Um, what is your plan of attack, right? You know, what's going to be, how are you going to roll this all out? Are you going to play through the whole piece? Are you going to do it in sections right away? Um, and then the last thing, it's not really a question, but just don't do the same thing all the time. Don't rehearse it always the same way. So don't always go to, well, let's go letter Z to the end and back up and go to the end. All right, let's try X and then go, you know, kind of do that. So don't be systematic with everything uh, in the exact uh, same way. So what is your plan of attack? Are you going to play through the whole piece right away? Are you going to do sections right away? Um, and then really don't do it uh, all, all the same, right? So I'm just going to kind of rattle off some suggestions of things if that's that's all right um, and then you can just kind of interrupt me as you feel uh, you need to so um, just some some general suggestions right um, and this is not some of these will work for very large pieces and some maybe not as well for small things or vice versa right so play through a section in its entirety and then rehearse it right so don't go right away uh, into rehearsing right um, you know, give people some continuity of what all it looks like, even if it doesn't go super well, 
uh, then go back and rehearse it so they can see uh, big pictures. So that's just one kind of baseline suggestion. Um, figure out what parts are similar or playing the same thing and have them play together, right? So that goes back to the previous, you know, when I would mark things uh, in green with similar lines, you can go to those green things like, well, you people are together. So now you guys can play together. Uh, then once they uh, do that, start to add in layers, right? So um, I, and I probably in a second could show you just what it looks like for like the notes I'll make for rehearsal, um, which might make a little bit uh, more sense all this. Um, but anyway, so build it in layers, right? So piece things together. So here, you know, second horn, second trombone, um, and E flat tube, you're all playing together, you know, with a unison line. We're going to have you guys play together. Okay, great. That's mastered. Let's add in now all the cornets because you have a line that makes sense, you know, similar to that. Piece that in. So build it in layers. That's another kind of just general uh, suggestion. Um, identify the hard parts and work on these separately and most likely slowly before doing it with the whole band, right? So if there's things that you know are going to be problematic or you've played it yourself and it's been problematic, identify those things ahead of time um, and kind of pinpoint those to get ahead of, of the big, big trouble. Um, and then, you know, kind of moving on from there is that once a, a section of a piece has been worked on, play through it in larger sections to reinforce what has been done and then also give context uh, to the whole thing, right? So play in a small section, work on it in a small section and play in a bigger section so they're just not used to just doing it at that one, one moment, right? And then just another suggestion in this thing, which goes back to your preparation is know your group and problem solve ahead of time, right? And so that comes in your, your preparation. You kind of know different things that might go wrong. Um, so you can be prepared uh, for, for that moment. Um, and I'll just kind of, I'll break for just a quick uh, you know, story uh, now on this. So one of the things, uh, I, there aren't a whole lot of positives to the last uh, you know, year and a half or so. But uh, for me, there's been two. One, I was going through all the Marvel movies in sequence early on in, uh, in the pandemic. So that was really great. Our family, every single night, we watched a movie, help us get through everything um, and be together all the time. The second part of it is my schedule really cleared out, right? So I had some space and time for things that maybe we wouldn't do all the time. And one thing is uh, some of my daughters, I have uh, two girls, 10 and 12 years old, um, they both really for the first time got into sports uh, this year, right? So my youngest daughter, Caroline, she loves to play basketball. That's all she really wants to do. Uh, oldest, um, she doesn't like sports as much, but she still participates in a few things. So they both played on a softball team this year together. Um, and it was really funny because I'm, I'm, I'm a bad sports parent. Like, I'll just say that, right? Um, like I go along and I'm chomping at the bit the whole time to be able to coach up or, you know, to try to help out. Eventually I worked myself into being an assistant softball coach. I'll just say that. Right. So eventually I get in, but it's really funny. Um, Cause I'm, I'm very comfortable in like the, the music sphere of, you know, teaching and, you know, kind of uh, you know, rehearsing things and having a plan, but it was interesting to see kind of in the context of sports and like kids sports, um, just all the similarities, you know, in it all. So um, you know, obviously you go to practice, right? And you're catching your know, ground ball, ground ball, ground ball. Okay, great. All the kids do wonderful, right? Ground ball, and then you throw to first base. No problem. They've got it, right? Okay, let's try to do this. You know, and you do, go through all these little steps, right? And they do it perfectly fine uh, in the moment of we're practicing ground balls. We're going to throw it to first base. That's the plan, right? That's, that's going to work great. So it goes great in practice, and they've mastered that one little tiny thing. So then you get into the game and all of a sudden the ball comes to them. They catch it on second base. They're supposed to throw it to first base. It doesn't work, right? Because there's just other elements around them, right? You have a player that's running, you know, to first base. Now you have all these other things. So um, it just kind of goes back for me to this, like the whole idea of, you know, play these things in these little small sections, but you can't just leave it with just those small sections. You have to give much greater context to the whole thing. Otherwise, you know, they catch the ball at second base and then throw it over the first baseman's you know, head all the time, right? They have to be able to learn in that little, you know, micro moment uh, how to do things properly, you know, from later, letter A to letter B. But then they also have to be able to navigate from letter A to letter K within that same thing, right? So it's just been, a, it's been a cool thing for, for me to watch and kind of reinforce, like, you know what, you can't just 
take the hard moment and teach the hard moment and assume that everything else is going to be okay because everything else also has to be experienced. People have to experience a whole piece of music. People have to experience all the transitions that are going to happen, all those kind of things. So you need to prepare them for every situation, much like it would be uh, in sports. And so that's kind of been the thing I've been I've just been thinking about a lot is, yes, situational perfection, absolutely. But broader sense, um, just understanding of what is supposed to happen and what you do in moments. It's not the you know, perfect analogy there, but it works works for me at the moment, just in terms of how I'm going to prepare uh, people for things. So um, that's just, just kind of an aside to it all. So just a few more uh, suggestions, you know, as we're, we're going through. Um, and uh, yeah, so for me, make notes ahead of time of uh, anything you think might be might be trouble. You may not use all of it, but the, but the more you're prepared, um, and if you identify some key points, it'll help you in the whole process, right? So if you have a page of notes, you may not necessarily look at them, but at least you've kind of you know put your mind into the whole thing. And the second part of it is 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 if you are someone who really prepares um, and makes notes for different things, and you come up with a plan, is don't necessarily get locked into your notes, right? Uh, react to what is actually happening and what you know maybe not what you thought would occur, because maybe maybe someone played it better. Um, you know, this week than they did last week, and you were expecting it to go wrong, and then work on it. So, you know, just react to what actually um, actually happens. Uh, third thing, uh, extra bit here is just uh, correct as you go uh, with areas of concern, uh, right? Don't just leave it, you know, for next week and then come back to it. You know, make sure you just you navigate it right at that moment, right? And for me, I'm just pretty. Uh, I feel like I'm just kind of out there. With like, hey, this didn't go right right now. Let's go back and correct this before you kind of uh, move move along. Um, I'd say then I'll, we talked about it a little bit, but play through uh, a whole piece often for continuity. Um, and uh, probably a good good example of that is a few years ago, uh, Dorothy Gates did a big piece for us, the Glory of Jehovah, which was was 25 minutes long. So we obviously had to rehearse lots of uh, little bits and you know sections to it, um, but for a good I don't know, month or so, um, regardless of how tired we were, you know, at, you know, the last half an hour of our, our rehearsal, we played through the entire piece just to kind of get a feel for what that actually felt like. So that when it came to performance, um, it was really no big deal to make it through the 25 minutes, right? So that's just kind of uh, something to think about there. And the last thing I would, I would say about just some suggestions for, uh, for rehearsal is, um, as much as you correct as you go with areas of concern, I would say also encourage as you go uh, with things that went well. And I, I have, I have even just written down here like I'm not very good at that, right? I very often forget to do that. Um, you just focus on the things that you need to correct, um, but really you need to let people know when things go well so that they know. Um, when they've reached a, a standard that is that is good enough as well, right? So you need to encourage um, as you go, as well as kind of correct as you go. So uh, that's just some just some quick suggestions. In uh, I guess that would be more like the rehearsal strategy kind of portion of of things there. Um, but uh, yeah, that's I guess that was ten or so items there. Um, Eric, yes, uh, yep. Give us give us some of your thoughts too about you know we've all. We've all played in the band, and sometimes you get into that um, automatic mode, you know, and you're just like, maybe, and maybe you don't realize it. But what are some um, strategies that maybe you have that to get a band out of that? You know, the, like sometimes it's just an attitude of just like we've talked about it a couple times this week where, oh, it's been a long day, and I just, we just got to get through this rehearsal you know, kind of thing, but what are maybe some things um, that you can think of maybe that kind of gets that group out of that, you know, we just finished lunch and we're sitting in this Zoom call. No, but you know what I mean? Like, what are some things in your, um, in your rehearsals maybe that just kind of give that little extra, because you, you gave the sports analogy and I'm sure, you know, we see coaches motivate all the time yeah. as well. Um, Why well, I, I a couple of things. One, it does go back to, you know, kind of one of the earlier, you know, things I said is you really do have to know, you have to know your band and know how they're, how they're wired, right? What, what can they handle? Um, what will push them to, to want to achieve something greater, 
you know, right then. So I think that's the first part is you have to know, you have to know your personnel, right? You have to know who, uh, who you're working with all the time. So like for like the New York staff band, uh, as an example, um, and that's, that's obviously not everybody's example, but I, I probably would classify us as a highly competitive group of people collectively, right? So knowing that um, you can go after people a little bit, you know, and we're from New York, right? So you can kind of handle that all the time. You can, like, people can handle just being upfront with them. So it's, it's okay. Uh, but I would say um, really, I don't want to say the most important thing, but, but for me, it's really the speed of your rehearsal, right? If you're very slow and you're, um, you know, you take a lot of time between things or you talk a lot and like explain things forever and day and you don't let people play, like you're probably going to lose people, right? So for me, I, and that's part of the whole being prepared thing is like, you can go from steps, you know, A through Z as quickly as possible, because you know, then they really don't have time to, to go to sleep or to be unmotivated if you're moving that quickly, right? Um, and really like, uh, you know, Harold is probably the best I've ever really ever seen with that, especially like in front of a chorus, just how rapid he is going from, from uh, thing to thing, um, which doesn't really give them a chance to get lulled to sleep there. But I would say you need to know your people. You need to know how, the, how they'll respond. One, you want to be quick uh, and not, not hurried in your whole thing, but you don't want to have downtime um, that's not necessary. Um, and then really like for me, people come to band rehearsal uh, because they want to play their instruments right? I don't think they want to come to listen to anyone talk. Yeah, right. So let people play, right? And I think that's the best thing to, to say to kind of get people, get people going, you know, there. So that's just a couple thoughts for me, but I tend to just try to go very quickly. Um, and then I, the other part of that is too, um, you know, if you're, you're a leader, there's probably some pieces that you choose that maybe everyone else doesn't love, right and then there's some that they all love just make sure you don't stack like the ones that um, are for like if you're preparing for commissioning and you need to play four congregational songs maybe don't stack the four congregational songs right next to each other you know, have some variety uh, in the things you do so hey we're going to play this and this and this okay now we're going for the king of heaven right so everyone has to get glued into that after maybe uh, a lull there there's one uh, question in the chat as well I think I, I saw it. Is that the baton question and not? Yes. Yeah. So um, funny enough, like in rehearsals, I very rarely use a baton. Um, and part of it is like I tend to kind of if something I feel isn't going perfectly right in terms of rhythm or accuracy, like I very quickly go to like a finger snap thing, you know, so it makes uh, kind of my fingers available for, for snapping um, if I don't have a baton, right? Um, so it's probably not the best thing ever because most of my rehearsals, I probably do it without a baton, but then when it comes to uh, performances, I do. Um, I'd say if, uh, you know, even within pieces of music, I've put it down or kind of put it in my left hand and, and done it with uh, right. So if it's something um, that just, I don't, I'm trying to say the right the right words for it. Uh, just some something that's very sensitive and has to be a little bit more controlled. I like to be able to have the use of like my fingers for such things, right? And you can't do that with a baton in your hand. Um, so I'd say if it was like kind of sensitive um, and music that had to move around a lot uh, in terms of just flexibility, I would probably tend to use my hands. Um, if it's more uh, rigid, is not the right word, but less like that than I would. Uh, generally, I use my baton. Right, um, but for rehearsals, a lot of times I just use my hands. Uh, so yeah, both both are there for me. I'm I, I guess I'm equally comfortable uh, using using you know using it or not. You know, so yeah, there's not really a great uh, great explanation there other than in rehearsals it's usually just my hands. So and it seems to work. So, <laughs> sure. Uh, we have a uh, another question. If you'll just come use the mic so everyone can hear. Hey, Derek, knowing something of your experience, having uh, studied at two great music schools, Juilliard and Curtis, um, playing in the West Point band, that's as pro as it gets. Um, now the leader of the New York staff band, but I'm also mindful of the fact that you're a soldier uh, at the Spring Valley Corps. Mm -hmm. 
where I'm assuming they also have a band as well, and you're probably a member of it. I know you've been the Sergeant Major uh, at that Corps. Uh, just to ask, the rehearsal strategy that you've outlined very thoroughly, would that be used in all of these contexts? Would you rehearse, if you were the bandmaster at Spring Valley, would you rehearse them the same way that you would rehearse the New York staff band? Or you might be rehearsed in the West Point band. How, there must be some adjustments, I would assume, that need to be made there. Um, absolutely, yes, that is 100%. Uh, um, and one of the things uh, that is interesting about it is, uh, so I have led the core band for quite a long time. Um, so yes, it's been, it's when I, I'll say this, when I first started doing the staff band, um, it was a little, I found it a little bit awkward because on Tuesday night, I would lead the core band and right, it was a little bit more, uh, I want to say family friendly, but it, I was, I would go after things less hard, right. Um, and be less, less aggressive with stuff. And then Wednesday morning, uh, and there's a whole bunch of people that are in both of them, you know what I mean? Uh, to kind of have like a flip uh, of that, um, you know, was a, I wouldn't say a challenge for me, but it, it was just something I, you kind of recognize early on. But I would say that a lot of things don't change, right? Uh, for me, I still have to have a plan uh, when I come into rehearsal, right? You still have to know, well, I'm going to start with this. I'm going to go into this. This is going to be the main meat of my rehearsal. I'm still going to move just as quickly between things. I'm still going to be just as uh, direct, you know, with people. Um, so like my, my mindset really doesn't, uh, doesn't shift um, just because that's my personality. But um, the amount of things that you're trying to jam into the, the time would certainly be less. So you don't have to kind of maybe go at things just as hard. But, you know, for me, um, I don't think I'm, and someone else could probably answer this you know, better for me, but I don't think I'm that different from one to the next. And um, my preparation you know, for it uh, and how I lay it out and how I interact with people um, you know, are very similar. Um, so it's just, if you're rehearsing uh, you know, Psalm 91 that's in Triumph series, and that's gonna be the main focus of your core band rehearsal because that's your selection on Sunday, that doesn't require the same amount of of detail and highlighting of things that it would to do the present age, you know, but in the context of if I was doing Psalm 91 at the core, and if I was doing Psalm 91 with a staff band, my preparation for those two things uh, would, would in fact stay the same. Um, and uh, like, I'm, I realize I'm, I'm fully over the top uh, on some of the preparation, you know, things and how I, you know, kind of outline and mark things ahead of time. Um, but you know, that doesn't really change uh, for me from one to the next, you know, for, for a period of time when I was at the, you know, at the core, I had like this goal for a while of like for a whole month of like never using a score, like at the core, like for a Sunday morning, uh, for any selections we were going to have or anything that happens just so I could you know, challenge myself to be just as prepared uh, all the time. So my mindset doesn't really change uh, in terms of my preparation or how I deliver information to people. Um, because it's just who I am, um, but the amount of the amount of music that goes into it, um, into a rehearsal, and the complexity of that music is really what changes. Is that a good answer, Bill? Great. Here comes uh, another question. Hey, Derek. Hey. Quick question. Um, in terms of score study, um, I'd imagine you're spending more time in preparation of the score study before you start a piece. But could you just talk about how, like, just in terms of actual, like, time, like, how much time would you typically spend, like, in hours doing store, score study before the first rehearsal and then after that started each week before rehearsal? Yeah, okay. Um, so it's it's hard. Uh, I, can re I can remember, like, very specific pieces um, and kind of how we did, did things. So I, I know the first time that I prepared um, the present age, like to rehearse with the staff in, and I, sorry, I keep going back to that one, but it's just the one I've, I probably prepared the longest for this uh, of anything. One, because we were going to, we were going to rehearse it. Um, and three weeks later, we were going to play it. Like that was the thing, right? We were, we we're going to do it quickly. So 
I know the before the first rehearsal of the present age, it was probably five or six hours um, in terms of actually just marking stuff up and then making notes uh, and that kind of stuff. So that was before the first time we went into a rehearsal. Um, and then after that, I kind of shredded the whole thing and then redid it uh, as well afterwards before the next rehearsal. So I'd say within like the first two rehearsals of doing you know, that piece, uh, you're probably talking eight, nine, 10 hours you know, for, for one piece of music. But um, I should say like our first rehearsal we did of the present age, um, we started staff band rehearsal. Um, you know, we did, you know, some kind of selection, you know, at the beginning to warm up. Um, then we rehearsed uh, the present age for two hours straight, um, then had devotions at the end and that was rehearsal, right? So I, five to six hours of, of kind of the first time, but I'd say like each week, uh, it does kind of depend on where, where we are uh, kind of in, in learning things. Um, but it's, it, it varies a lot, right? But I would say on average, I'm probably putting in three, four hours uh, a week, you know, but then when there's some special, special circumstances, a new piece of music that no one knows, um, you know, that kind of stuff that would, that would kind of change uh, what that, what that looks like, you know what I mean? So I guess that's a, yeah, short version there. Great. Does anyone, oh, we have another one. So I am a horn player, and there have been many a rehearsal where the uh, director just gets really tunnel visioned on trying to work on a section, and next thing you know, it's been 35 minutes since I've touched my horn, because the horn parts are usually really boring or really fun, you know, and so I was wondering if you had any tips or tricks on ways to kind of keep us from doing that, particularly like with the horns or with the percussion section especially <laughs> um yeah so uh the easy part right is going going back to like you know, people come to rehearsal because they want to play their horn they don't want to come to rehearsal to sit and sit and listen to you know someone talk right so it's very similar uh in you know kind of how you build things you know for rehearsal where you know obviously there's some parts where you know we kind of talked about earlier where hey you know second horn second trombone second, you guys are together great okay move on and you start to build it uh, in layers. Um, and I think, you know, one key point there is um, you always want to add the context of everything else, right? So if you're really focused on, okay, we have this trombone corral here and that's, that's the most important thing that's happening, right? But people then need to experience what that's like you know, with the trombone corral happening and then everything else, right? So you have to kind of build it, uh, build it in layers all the time. And then, uh, so that's one thing, right? Bring people in quickly uh, after it's been just one group of people uh, playing. Um, and then uh, the second thing I would say is that um, just because you have specific instructions, you know, for one section doesn't mean necessarily that they have to just play it by themselves, right? I feel like you can give people instructions, but then have everyone play, right? So trombones, your first note, it needs, you know, it needs to go to beat two, then your piano on beat three, then you're back to forte. You guys got that? Okay, great. Full band. Here we go. One, and everyone's in, right? You can give instruction uh, to specific people, but then still involve everyone if it's not something super, super complex, right? So you don't always have to, okay, cornets, we're going to work on this. We're going to play for a while uh, and, and do whatever. And then, uh, then everyone else is going to come back in, you know, five minutes later, you can add people into that very quickly, or you can give instruction to the cornets and then still have everyone, everyone do it. Um, and then the last thing I, I would say uh, is that if there's, you know, any issues that really should involve um, like a group of people playing for 20 minutes straight and no one else doing anything, um, you could also just say, hey, on this rehearsal, you know, instead of the full band being here at 1245, why doesn't everyone else show up at 115? We're going to work with the cornets on some problem spots, you know, for a while so that you go back to the, you don't want to waste anyone's time. You want to respect their time. They want to be there to play. So if you really don't need them until 115, they can show up at 115, right? Or if, uh, you know, if you really have to do something, you know, like if you're working on, you know, Corpus Christi, you know, and there's a whole big long section that's only tubas and euphoniums. Well, guess what? Not everyone needs to sit there for the whole thing. The whole rest of the band can can go home and come back next week, you know, uh, for that portion of time. So I think there's certainly ways ways around it. Um, I just, 
I would never really spend that much time kind of focused in on one section. One, because other people are going to get bored. Two, the section you're probably working on, you know, for that 25 minutes, is probably going to get demoralized by the end of it, right? So I would say quickly move on to involving more people. That's great. I don't know if you have anything else, but we were um, just about out of time. Yeah, I, I only had, honestly, I only had like a couple more things uh, just to say in terms of like just building an overall uh, rehearsal and I'll just go through them super fast and then we can, you know, call it a day. Does that work? Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Okay. So I just, I have kind of three things uh, within rehearsals, like kind of the, the big uh, overarching things. Uh, you have new pieces that you need to work on. You have pieces that are run throughs that you kind of know very well. Um, and then things that you need to drill and you need to maintain a, ba a balance of those things, right? So new pieces, you want to read things very often so people can sight read. You want to be able to build your repertoire. So you read new pieces and then you wanna develop uh, sight reading and problem solving skills. So read things um, more often. And then also you wanna try out new material. You wanna try out the new uh, American Band Journal or whatever it might be. So you wanna do new pieces often to develop those things. You wanna have pieces uh, that you run through, uh, which are pieces that um, people know already. Um, these are also not the main focus of your rehearsal, right? We've gotta play this March, let's just run through it just because we wanna just be reminded of what that is. Um, you want to keep uh, you you'll do some things to run through if you want to keep a piece close so if you've rehearsed it before it's been a month let's just play it just so when we play it again in three weeks it's not it hasn't been two months right um, and then also you want to run through things because you want to build up the stamina of your group to be able to survive uh, the pieces that you're going to play and then you have pieces in your rehearsal that are pieces you want to drill right and this is the main focus of, of your rehearsal. Um, and then uh, something to think about is you want to do do that uh, when people are fresh, but not necessarily the first thing, right? So I usually would try to stack a couple things uh, that are very easy at the beginning and then get into kind of the meat of your rehearsal with um, the pieces you want to drill. And the last thing I'll say about pieces to drill is you don't want to drill every piece, right? You want to have a variety of new pieces, things you can just kind of run through, and then th things that you really want to rehearse uh, and really, really drill. So there you go. That's it. <laughs> Derek, we thank you so much. There's such a wealth of information um, and uh, your experience as, as you continue to grow. Um, so thank you so much for your time today. Um, and we just want to thank you um, from us to you. And let me let me just say, Tom, too, um, really, if uh, if anyone ever wants to kind of just uh, sit and chat about, you know, preparing for rehearsals or that kind of stuff. Like I could do that for forever. Uh, so uh, happy to, to share even more. Um, I have a couple, you know, I, I could have shown, but just, you know, what my notes look like for rehearsal and that kind of stuff, just to kind of get an idea of, of how I prepare. So if there's anyone who really wants to have any further conversations about anything uh, as it relates to rehearsal preparation or anything like that, uh, feel free to give me a holler. Um, probably not next week. I'm not available. Uh, but anytime after that, uh, feel free to reach out. Yeah, have a great week in Star Lake, and uh, we'll be keeping you in our prayers. All right, thanks, Tom. Thanks, everybody.